Yuri Perez, welcome to the show, and welcome to Fantasy Baseball Today. On Thursday, May 11th, I am Frank Sample, joined by Chris Towers. Unfortunately, the Welsh is uh, dealing with an issue, so he's not going to be on the podcast today, but we're still here. And here's what we've got. We're going to recap Wednesday's action, another huge prospect promotion. What do we do? Literally. With- yes. <laughs> Good point. I like that. Uh, What do we do with Eduardo Rodriguez and Lance Lynn trending in complete opposite directions right now and much more? Before we get started, please like this video and subscribe on YouTube if you haven't already. And if you're listening on the audio side, download, follow, and leave a five-star rating. We really appreciate it. Thank you very much. Uh, And for those in the YouTube chat, I do apologize. Like (laughs) I always have it set up for a certain time, and then I'm usually 10 to 15 minutes late. It has nothing to do with Chris. It's completely my fault. I'm just kind of like reorganizing the rundown and getting everything ready to go. So I do apologize. But Chris, we're here and let's talk about Yuri Perez, who will make his Marlins debut this Friday, arguably a top three pitching prospect entering the season. You mentioned literally he is huge. Six foot eight, (laughs) 20 years old with a massive fastball, uh, potential plus changeup and slider as well. In six starts at AA this season, at 232 ERA, 0.81 whip, 42 strikeouts, over 31 innings pitched. And I think most people are going to say, well, look what just happened to Brandon Fott, right? We've got to keep our expectations in check. And I think that's a fair point. But I also want to point out that Yuri Perez is, he's in a different stratosphere. Again, like of all the prospect promotions this season, of all the pitching pitchers that have been promoted, Yuri Perez, well, outside of Grayson Rodriguez, Yuri Perez has the highest prospect pedigree. He is coming into the season. He was ranked higher than Tanner Bybee and Bryce Miller and Logan Allen and all those other names. Chris, what are you expecting from Yuri Perez? And do you think he's a must-add player? 37% rostered. Yeah, you mentioned he's 20. It's worth pointing out. He turned 20 26 days ago. Yeah. He started the season at double A. After being pretty good at double A last year, he started the season at double A as a 19 year old. Uh, he's six foot eight, 220 pounds, throws in the high 90s with good shape. And the thing that you always see when you read the scouting reports for Yuri Perez is the command is just unnaturally good for someone who's that big. You know, pitch hitters feel like he's on top of them because he's so big, he's so long, but. walks per nine for his career, also in double A. This is not necessarily, I mean, we don't know what he's going to look like in the majors, obviously, but this is not necessarily an Edward Cabrera situation where walks are likely to be an issue. He has very good command. I do think Yuri Perez is, okay, maybe not a must roster player. You know, we don't know how long he's going to be up. This could just be until Trevor Rogers is ready or Johnny Cueto. Cueto did. Uh, He's restarted his rehab assignment, but he's been off and on. I I think he was bad in his most recent rehab start. But like this is a situation where it's entirely possible. He gets one, maybe two starts, doesn't do well and gets sent down. Or it's a situation where the Marlins are pretty desperate to make a playoff run. They are three games over 500 right now, I believe, despite being 12 and O in one run games, they are, this is the definition of playing with house money. I think they have the worst run differential in the national league right now. Um, Wow. So this is a team that pretty desperately needs to get better in order to stay afloat. And if Yuri Perez comes out and looks as good as we think he can, I, I think he has a very good chance to stay. So yeah, I think he's someone that, I would drop Edward Cabrera for certainly. I would probably be okay dropping Lance Lynn for him. I think I would drop the likes of Tyler Anderson for him. Now, none of those are are slam dunks to be worse than Yuri Perez the rest of the way. It's possible he makes two starts, isn't great, and then we don't see him again until next season. That's entirely possible, but the upside here is significant. It's worth chasing. One thing I will point out, and I don't know, apologize apologies if you guys talked about this last week on the show, but he does pitch in the Southern League uh, at AA, and the Southern League has been the proving grounds for a new type of baseball that Major League Baseball is developing that is more like the baseball that they use in Japan. It's pre-tacked would be the way to uh, say it, I guess. It's just a stickier ball, and so... 
making the leap from double A to the majors already is asking a ton of a 20 year old. We've talked about how the, uh, the transition to the majors might be more difficult now than it has been in recent years. And this is an even bigger jump and he's using a different baseball. So it could be a situation where the, the transition is even more difficult here, but Yuri Perez is the type of blue chip prospect that I think is worth betting on. I think it's a fantastic point that you bring up. And yes, the Welsh and I spoke about how they are using that pre-tack ball at double a and, Specifically, we brought it up because Andrew Abbott, who is a pitching prospect with the Reds, recently got promoted from double A AA to triple A. And in double A, his numbers were out of this world. We're talking a 20K per nine, 22% <laughs> swinging strike rate. And he recently got promoted to triple A. And he's still pitching very well, 14.4K per nine, but a 13% swinging strike rate, right? So some of those numbers have taken a bit of a step back and Abbott is still pitching well. But I think it's a really good point that you bring up about Yuri Perez was using a different ball. So maybe it inflated some of those strikeout numbers a little bit. I really like what you had to say about the control as well. Something really interesting about if you go to fangraphs.com and you search a player, specifically a prospect, they have the prospect report on top Mm -hmm. and they have grades and it'll be, for example, his fastball is a 60 out of 70, 60 out of 80. The way that works is it's present and future grade. Correct. Yeah. Well, I see 70. I don't mean, <laughs> am I looking at the wrong Yuri Perez? No, no, no. Yeah. It's on the 80, the 20 to 80 grade. Right. Scale. But the, the way that works is he has a 60 present grade, 70 future grade. Yes. That's exactly what I wanted to point out. And his command right now is 50 with a 70 future grade. Yeah. So they are projecting his command to be really, really good. Again, that's Yuri Perez we're talking about. He's 37% rostered. I moved him up to SP 69 in my rankings, which is, just ahead of Logan Allen, uh, the Guardians Logan Allen. It's just ahead of Taj Bradley, ahead of Mason Miller. But it's behind Tanner Bybee, and it's behind Bryce Miller. Chris, what do you think about just where he ranks among the other pitching prospects? Because I don't know when we're going to see Taj Bradley again. Like, Obviously, I want to hold on to him. This Mason Miller injury situation is mm-hmm. kind of up in the air. I think Logan Allen is good, and he's proven himself, and he's pitched well. I, I just think Yuri Perez's upside is higher. Frankly, I just really like what I've seen so far from Bybee and Bryce Miller. Yeah, I think that's reasonable. Miller, I I think I would have Perez over Miller, but I could not. I couldn't look you in the eye and tell you, yeah, you should drop Bryce Miller after the way he's pitched in his first two starts. I have some doubts about how sustainable it is throwing a fastball 70% of the time, specifically uh, not getting a ton of swings and misses overall from what I remember. Um, But like you can't drop him even for a guy like Yuri Perez right now after what he's shown. So, you know, I think, um, I think that's about right. Like he's as talented as arguably any pitcher that we've seen make the leap, but we've also seen with Grayson Rodriguez, who we thought was the most talented and the most ready that, you know, he, he's still, it's, it's tough to make that leap. So I'm very excited to see Yuri Perez pitch. He is no, by no means a sure thing. The Marlins have earned the benefit of the doubt, I think, in far, terms of the development of pitchers, but we're also seeing with Edward Cabrera, it's not always linear. That is correct. So, uh, yeah, I, I think that's about the right range. I apologize to anyone who's looking at the rankings, by the way. I I was on vacation last week, which I, which I knew about, and I was out for five days, so I haven't updated them since then. And then I got selected for jury duty. So <laughs> I'm basically only doing the podcast and the FBT newsletter right now. And I really don't have time for anything else. Hopefully I'll be able to update my rankings in earnest next week, but I apologize. There will probably not be any rankings updates for me from me this week. No trade values chart either. I'm so sorry. And things things are kind of hectic right now. Yeah, I can see that. Um, If you're ever looking for our rankings, by the way, you can find them on the website, cbssports.com slash fantasy slash baseball slash rankings. And, uh, Scott and my rankings are were recently updated here on Thursday. Yuri Perez is in there and made a whole bunch of changes to starting pitcher and, and all the positions. So you can go and check those out on the site. Uh, all right, Chris, let's get into the rest of Wednesday's action. Oh, my good, goodness gracious. Atta girl, Susan. All right, where do we want to start? Uh, I said Eduardo Rodriguez, right? He's yes. he's probably the, the Olive Garden breadstick of the day and – He's just been really awesome. I think his last five starts in particular have been uniformly excellent. He's gone, yeah, at least 
Let me see. Okay, last six starts, he's gone at least five and two-thirds innings in each with no more than one earned run allowed. He has one double-digit strikeout effort in that stretch, three with at least eight strikeouts. And today his velocity was up. Uh, he had eight strikeouts over seven shutout innings. His velocity on his four-seam fastball was up 1.1 mile per hour. It's about a mile per hour up on everything. And that's really encouraging because his velocity has been down the last couple of seasons. And remember, it's been a really difficult and weird couple of years for Eduardo Rodriguez. We've I, I've mentioned this the last few times we've talked about him, but it's worth mentioning that in 2020, we weren't sure he was ever going to pitch in the majors again. He had myocarditis as a result, as a side effect of having COVID. It was a heart condition. We weren't sure we were ever going to see him again. Came back in 2021, was not great, but the peripherals were very, very good. 3-3-2 FIP, despite a 4-7-4 ERA. Last season, again, just really weird. He had that situation where he was away from the team. We didn't really know what was going on. Uh, and, you know, his overall numbers weren't great. But coming off that 2021 season, myself and a lot of people thought that he was a potential breakout candidate. And maybe that's what we're seeing is just a little bit of a delayed breakout uh, situation for Eduardo Rodriguez. I I'm very encouraged by what we see. Yeah, he has been uh, fantastic. Eduardo Rodriguez has a seven shutout with eight more strikeouts at the Guardians, 14 swinging strikes. And if you look at if you're trying to figure out what is he doing differently this year? He's limiting hard contact, and the control has been amazing. 1.7 walks per nine so far this season. He's right around three for his career. So my assumption here, Chris, is that there will be some regression in terms of the walks and the control, but we've seen Eduardo Rodriguez, even with that bad control, have fantasy viable seasons in the past. So it's not just like, oh my God, panic sell Eduardo Rodriguez, but I think it's a conversation worth ha having. I moved sure. him up to... SP 55 Scott mm -hmm. has him at SP 50 and uh, I think you, you could try to sell high on Eduardo Rodriguez right now again it's that term sell high uh, but I don't know who are you buying low on? like if you could flip Erod for Alec Manoa right now absolutely would do that yes you would do it okay what about Lodolo I feel like that we're getting a little bit closer I think I would just the strikeout upside I, I would like to see how the calf issue uh, that got him pushed back in recent days. I'd like to see how that works out because that is potentially an exp explanation for why he hasn't been as good as we hoped for. Um, I would trade. I think I would do Reed Detmers, but that one's a little worry, a, a little more worrisome, just mostly for me. I actually really still believe in the talent. I think uh, he's going to be much better moving forward, but there's a cap on how valuable he can be because of that six man rotation. You know, he's only made six starts so far. Uh, so I, that's a complicating factor, but yeah, I think like 55th overall, that's a good range for him. And uh, yeah, I think it would have to be Reed Detmers plus another piece, like uh, sure. a starter, a, a hitting starter that you can, you know, play on your team. Uh, two outfielders that stand out, Chris, that are off to slow starts, Starling Marte and Teoscar Hernandez. Sure. You would do it for either one. Yeah, I, I like if you're looking for someone to add to Reed Detmers, maybe Stephen Kwan, who's been a little underwhelming. Um, you know, that might be enough to get it done. But it's to say that, like, I want guys who are must start players in return. And right. I think, uh, you know, that's what I'm looking for with with if I'm trading Erod. Again, this isn't an indictment on Erod. If you're not getting fair value for him right now, if someone's not offering you a trade for him as if he were a top, you know, 25 or top 30 ranked pitcher, then just hold and see where it goes. I mean, the way yep. he's pitching right now, I, I think he's in line for two more starts next week. So, all right. If, if no one overwhelms you, just hold on to Erod and, you know, hope that he continues to, to pitch well. He's done it in the past. Somebody on the opposite end of the spectrum, Chris, <laughs> is Lance Lynn, who, frankly, I was very bullish on coming into the year. Uh, and uh, he's let me down. He's let me down quite a bit. Got rocked once again, this time at the Royals, who, again, I will point out, if they don't have the most home runs in May, then they are close to it. I think they lead the American League in home runs in the month of May. So their offense has been better, but no excuses. Lance Lynn was bad. Five innings, seven runs, two more home runs allowed in this one. Eight hard hits, 90.8 mile per hour average exit velocity this season. He has allowed 11 home runs. 
That is the fourth most in baseball so far. He's got a 7.51 ERA, a 1.6 whip, still getting tons of strikeouts. I mean, we're talking about an 11K per nine. What has gone wrong? Well, obviously, I just ran through the home runs and the exit velocity. The control has been a problem. Three and a half walks per nine so far this year for Lance Lynn. He's getting up there in age. Who's to say, you know, this isn't just, all right, he's starting to fall off the cliff. Frankly, I don't really see enough in the numbers to say that's actually what's happening here, Chris. And mm -hmm. I know most people who have Lance Lynn won't want to hear this. I would still be looking to buy dirt cheap if I can. I mean, he got off to a brutal start last year. Look at his first, I think it was seven or eight starts last mm -hmm. year at, versus his final, like, 15. He was amazing over his final 15 starts. And sometimes guys just get off to a slow start like this. It's frustrating, uh, but I would still be looking to buy really, really cheap if you can on Lance Lynn. Yeah, I think that's fair. I, you know, I do. I wonder if there's something mechanically going wrong. You know, you look at the some of the like release and extension data and, and he's a little off there relative to where he's been. So it, it could be, you know, some mechanical tweaks could be all he needs. But, you know, it's also a 35, 36 year old. So it's it's possible that we're seeing he's 35. He turns 36. It's also possible that we're just seeing the, the end of the line. I, I will point out he's getting a lot of whiffs. He's got a 30 percent whiff rate on his four seam, his cutter, his curveball and his changeup. Um, so that's a good sign. He's getting a ton of strikeouts. 29 percent uh, would be the highest of his career. So there are still some reasons to be, I don't want to say optimistic, but maybe hopeful that things can get better for Lance Lynn. I would prefer not to drop him, but I would if I, if Yuri Perez was out there and that was the worst pitcher on my staff. Um, and yeah, I, I think buying low is still a viable option. Yeah, I mean, that last part, part you said, like earlier, you mentioned that you would drop Lynn for Yuri Perez. If he's the worst pitcher on my team, okay, and it's a shallow league, like someone else is probably not going to pick up Lance Lynn. That's fine. But in a deeper league, you probably have a pitcher worse, right? So I, in a, in a vacuum, I don't think I would want to drop Lance yeah. Lynn. Uh, next week, he's going up against the Guardians, who are struggling offensively, and the Royals once again. So it's, you know, it's... One tougher matchup, I guess you could say, and and one easier matchup. Would you uh, would you start or sit him uh, for two starts next week? Starting points, I would have trouble in a, in a roto league starting him. Yep, I think that's fair. Uh, shout out to uh, our our favorite our favorite uh, hitter here on this podcast, Chris Juan Soto, who went one for three with two walks, a sock, and two shoes. That's right, a homer and two steals. He's now up to six home runs, three steals on the season. And over his last 11 games, he is batting 400 with six doubles, two homers, two steals, and a 95 mile per hour average exit velocity. Patience. I know. It's it, good. It's been going I, yeah. for over a year now. Like, I know. It's been a long time now that Juan Soto has not been himself. But he's I will, he's I will point out, if you look at this, was something that I, I looked at today because I, you know, one, uh, our, our friend Chris, who emails the show and came up with the Juan Succo uh, nickname, has upgraded him to Juan Soso. So that's an important update. Um, and the other thing I want to point out is just like a bigger picture thing with Juan Soto. I know he's been bad for basically a full year. If you look at baseball reference, like the most com com comparable players to Juan Soto, the top guy is pretty much Mel Ott, who, member of the Major League Baseball Hall of Fame, 500 home run guy one of the best young hitters of all time, which is what we always say about Juan Soto. Mel Ott, through his age 23 season, 985 OPS for his career. He played in the 1920s, 1930s, and 40s. Then his age 24 season, struggled, 834 OPS. Struggled being a relative term in this instance. Uh, his next, like, 10 seasons or something, his OPS was back up above 950. So, like, these things can happen, even to Hall of Fame players. And I know that... The stack has page and, and all that, like he's pulling the ball too much. He hasn't been right. All of those things are true. It's also just to remind everyone that this is a Hall of Fame caliber player. This is a 24-year-old who you can fairly say is a likely Hall of Famer. There are like eight of those dudes you've ever been able to say about that in Major League Baseball history. Bet on those guys figuring it out. Yes, his mechanics were screwed up and his swing hasn't been perfect and he's still pulling the ball too much and all those things are true. 
bet on Hall of Famers figuring it out. That's my rant. Juan Soso. I love it. <laughs> <laughs> that gave me a real chuckle today. <laughs> that is good. All right, let's take our first break. When we get back, I want to talk about uh, some injury updates to the Braves pitchers, some rough news. Uh, Julio Rodriguez drops a sixth in the Mariners lineup. We'll break it all down here on Fantasy Baseball Today. One weekend in May, only the best are welcome. An invitation reserved for legendary players and future stars challenging each other at one of the most extraordinary courses in the nation. A major moment awaits the PGA Championship on CBS. Quick reminder to sign up for our Fantasy Baseball Today newsletter. Head to cbssports.com slash newsletters, punch in your email address, and hit sign up. It's easy as that, and it's free. You get it. Uh, you get the latest news and articles delivered right to your inbox. If you're watching us live on YouTube, then you can uh, scan the QR code. That will also take you to the website where you can sign up. Uh, Dan Schneier usually does a great job with it. He's actually out right now, so you can get Chris's thoughts, who has been writing the newsletter this week. So uh, make sure to check it out and sign up for free. Braves pitcher updates, Chris. This is a rough one. Max Freed and Kyle Wright are both expected to miss at least, at least the next two months and i was updating the rankings and i have an idea of uh give you an idea of where i moved them down to max freed to sp45 he is part of a, a trio right now which includes luis severino tristan mckenzie and then max freed is at the bottom of that and then i moved kyle tyler right. glass now tyler glass now higher i moved tyler glass now up into like another trio of injuries okay. so sp28 29 and 30 is glass now woodruff and carlos Rodon. that makes sense and then uh, I moved Kyle Wright all the way down to SP74. Obviously, yeah. he's not the same skill level as Max Fried, and he's not as proven. And frankly, he could miss even more time than Max Fried. So I don't ever want to like try to predict injuries. They're, I'm not a doctor, and I don't have access to his medicals. This just feels like a lost season, and I'm, I'm kicking myself that I wasn't more skeptical of him coming into the season because of the you know, the, the shoulder issue and the like, Oh, his shoulder feels better than it has in years. And, and it's like, uh, I feel dumb. <laughs> I feel like I, I wasn't really on him, but I, I should have just been out on Max free uh, or on a uh, Kyle, right? Max Fried is an example of like why we do when we do the, like, I told you this guy was going to get hurt. It's like, well, okay. Yeah. Guys also just get hurt sometimes. I mean, look for the most part in his career, Max Fried has been relatively healthy. So it's, it's yeah. just, uh, it's pretty random, but adds to the theme, I guess, so far of this season. Lots of starting pitcher injuries. Where do the Braves go from here? It sounds like Jared Schuster will occupy at least one of those spots in the time being. And there was a rumor that Mike Soroka could start this weekend. However, he is also attempting to come back from a crazy injury. He's, you know, torn his Achilles twice now. Yeah. And five starts in the minors. He's got a 523 ERA, a 160 whip, about a strikeout per inning. He's gotten beat up his last two starts. I'm not holding anything against him, Chris, because again, what he's attempting to come back from is like catastrophic. So I just don't think that there's going to be much fantasy value there. Maybe I'm wrong. Uh, Even a decade ago, Achilles injuries were basically career enders across most sports. Now it's gotten better, but it's still arguably the toughest injury to come back from. Maybe not for pitchers. Shoulder injuries tend to be a little uh, scarier, especially when you have surgery. But it's you should expect nothing from Mike Soroka, is what I would say. He struggled at AAA in his rehab assignment. Anything you get for him from him is a bonus at this point. I, I I'm rooting for him. I hope that he's good, but. The, the odds are against him, and I would certainly much rather have Yuri Perez than Mike Soroka, for instance. And I would assume yeah. Soroka's roster rate is probably higher at this point. Uh, uh, I, I don't know about that. Uh, let's look that up real quick. Mike Soroka is... 40%. Uh, right, yep, just 40%. Tiny, that is a crazy. bit higher. There, so there aren't probably many leagues where drop Mike Soroka for Yuri Perez is a thing, but drop Mike Soroka for Yuri Perez. Yeah, I'd imagine a lot of those are keeper dynasty leagues or something. People are just holding on to the name value. Again, I'm rooting for the guy, but yes. the odds are very clearly stacked against Mike Soroka right now. Julio Rodriguez dropped to sixth in the Mariners lineup, and I think I saw 
This is the first time he's batted anywhere outside of leadoff since last August. So that, you know, he's basically just been entrenched in that spot. What is the problem this season? Julio Rodriguez is currently batting 205, 270, 384. Still has six home runs and six steals. So he's giving you power and speed. The strikeout rate is up a little bit to 29%, which again is, it's on the higher side. It's not great. You, you don't, you don't love that. Uh, quality of contact is down a touch across the board, Chris. There's not really anything that stands out in a major way. I mean, the expected stats are basically the same as they mm -hmm. were last year. They weren't very good last season. So maybe that's something we should have paid attention to more during draft season. His Babbitt has dropped nearly 100 points compared to last year. So I think he's been unlucky. He also dealt with some back soreness earlier on in the season. So maybe he's like still kind of struggling with that right now. Overall, I mean, I'm like slightly worried, but not completely. What do you think? The nice thing about having invested a first round pick in, in Julio Rodriguez is one, it means you didn't draft Trey Turner. So you got that going for you. <laughs> uh, but, you know, a more serious thing is like, Oh no, Julio Rodriguez has been so bad. He's on a 25 25 pace still. That batting average is a killer. Oh, yeah, yeah. He's been bad. There's no question about it. It's just like this is the caliber of player we're talking about here. And like I would think that, like you said, there's some bad luck there. His expected batting average is a still not great 251. That is obviously much better than 205. So I. I think better days are ahead. If you get an opportunity to buy low on Julio Rodriguez, I would absolutely do that. But yeah, he might be more like a Randy Arozarena or Adolis Garcia type than a first rounder. But that's, I think, kind of the nice thing about him is like, that's still a pretty high floor. Yeah. All right. So if you have the opportunity, buy low on Julio Rodriguez. I think that goes without saying. Just hope that he's healthy. I, you know, I I don't know if this back thing is lingering for him, but there sure. is a chance that it is. Let's move into some waiver wire hitters, Chris. And uh, Jaron Duran, to my surprise, he's still just 71% uh, rostered. I think he is a must-roster player at this point. Two more hits on Wednesday, a walk, a double, picked up his sixth uh, steal of the season. He is now ranked inside of my top 40 outfielders on the season, and... He's batting near 400. He's giving you power and speed. He's hitting the ball extremely hard. I think Jaron Duran's roster rate, Chris, needs to be 100%. Yeah, it's it's always tough the further you get into the season for players to become 100% rostered because people you know fall off and yeah. all that stuff. But yeah, I, I mostly agree. Jaron Duran, he's doing what we hoped he would. This is not sustainable. He's probably more like a 250 hitter than... You know, shocking. He's not a 370 hitter. I don't think that I think that goes without saying, but like he's probably more like a 250, 260 hitter, but that's still useful when he's going to steal a bunch of bases and, and he's hitting the ball hard enough that it's not unreasonable to expect him to hit for some power. That park's going to hold him back in that regard. That's a tough place for lefties to hit home runs. But yeah, all the underlying stats for Jaron Duran are very positive. He still produced very well at AAA, even when he was struggling to make a, a an impact in the majors. So, I I'm I'm with you on him being worth rostering in all all formats. All right, how about let's see? I'm gonna let's pit a few players up against each other. Harrison Bader, I brought him up yesterday. Scott was pretty dismissive of him, and I look. Harrison Bader has a very weird track record where one year he steals bases, one year he hits for power. He's had trouble staying on the field. He went one for four with his third home run in just eight games since returning. This was a Yankee Stadium special if I've ever seen one too, so I'll just throw it out there. Uh, but he's batting 429 with three home runs, only two strikeouts in eight games so far. 68% roster. He's got seven games next week, including either three or four in Cincinnati, so obviously it's a great place to hit. Uh, Andrew McCutcheon went three for three with a walk and his seventh home run quietly just solid 255 seven homers four steals nearly as many walks as strikeouts Chris who would you rather have Harrison Bader or Andrew McCutcheon I would rather have Andrew McCutcheon I'm just not a Harrison Bader fan I just he's got three home runs now three home runs in eight games I and it's probably like what 11 in 50 games with the Yankees or something he's I, I, I kind of wonder if he figured something out in the postseason where he had that big power surge and maybe it's just kind of 
carried over into this season? I don't know. Maybe. Uh, he, but he has a 26% hard hit rate. And look, we're talking about 23 batted balls so far. So there's not a ton of ev- uh, evidence one way or the other here. But I, I'm just not a Harrison Bader believer. There are people who think he's good. I am not one of them. And so you're asking the wrong guy if you want the optimistic take on Harrison Bader. I, I'm just, I've never been a believer in his skill set. And uh, yeah, that's, that's, that's a big no from me. Hey, all we can do is tell you what the data says and 83.7 mile per hour average exit velocity. I'm sure it would rank among the worst in baseball. So. Yeah. Eight home runs in 30 games with the Yankees, by the way. So. Yeah. I, this is one where I'm, I'm willing to be wrong. If, if I'm, if I'm missing something on Harrison Bader, so be it. But I just, I don't believe in him. Fair enough. How about these two? Lamont Wade went one for four with a walk and his seventh home run. He's batting 260, uh, more walks and strikeouts. He's got a 13% barrel rate and Max Kepler went two for five with his sixth home run in 22 games since returning from the IL. He's batting 244 with five homers and a 93-mile-per-hour average exit velocity, nearly 10 miles per hour more than Harrison Bader. Uh, Chris, <laughs> who would you rather have, Lamont Wade or Max Kepler? They're, they're actually pretty similar players. What do you think? Yeah, I... Kepler, there's always, like, some interesting things about Kepler, and then he kind of just underwhelms across the board. I think that's probably because he's so fly ball and pull heavy that it's just, like, he hits a lot of infield fly balls and it's just always dragged his batting average down. Um, I think I would go with Wade, but they're like you said, they're very similar and you can make a case that because Kepler plays on a team that's likely going to play him more consistently and in a better home park, you can make a case for him over Lamont Wade. I think that's fine. Yeah. I just kind of trust the giants, the way that they've kind of worked sure. their magic with uh, hitters the past couple of years. And that barrel rate is interesting. It- the plate discipline's good. So it's such a double edged sword, the Giants thing. Yeah. Because they're really, really good at playing matchups and figuring out not just platoon stuff, but they they take a lot of like a pr- vertical approach angle into account. And like they really match up players based on how what types of pitchers they're good against, but that also can lead to playing time concerns. So yeah. Although I do I will give Max Kepler credit. He has not had a pop-up rate over 10% since 2020. Uh, and it's down to around 6% over the past season and, you know, change. So he's been better in that regard than I gave him credit for. I apologize to Max Kepler. Lamont Wade, uh, I'm just kind of looking at his game log now. I didn't realize this. He has started 11 of their past 12 games. So he is That's just pretty good. Unless all of those games are against right-handed pitchers. Yeah. Uh, it. It seems like he's mostly an everyday player. I'll take Lamont Wade, but I think both guys are kind of interesting right now. This live last group includes Christopher Morell, who went two for four with a double and two RBI, two batted balls over 109, 109 exit velocity. One of them was 112.1, just amazing stuff there. Uh, Eddie Rosario went two for four with a double and an RBI over his last 14 games. He's batting 346 with two home runs, lots of hard contact as well. And Lane Thomas stays hot. He went two for five with his fourth home run. He's batting 281 with four homers and three steals overall on the season. Uh, Chris Morell, Eddie Rosario, Lane Thomas. How do you rank those three? Um, so this is not what you asked, but I would take Christopher Morell over every player that we've talked about in this section, except for Jaron Duran. Uh, I just I think I think I would too. <laughs> I just, I think he's a real, I mean, I made the comp yesterday to, sub peak Javier Baez. You look at what he's done at the highest levels of the minors, double A AA and triple A 168 games. He's had 36 home runs, 25 stolen bases, a lot of strikeouts. That's going to be a problem for him. He's going to strike out close to 30% of the time, but as long as he strikes out like 29% of the time, rather than 33% of the time, I think Chris Morrell is going to be pretty useful for fantasy, especially in Roto. I think points leagues, it might be harder, although he's eligible for positions. I think it's just second base and outfield. Is it just second base and outfield? I thought he, okay. I thought he got more third base um, last season, but yeah, he oh, only nine games last year. No, sorry. Anyway, no, he's third base eligible as well. He, nope, he's not. It's 20 games, isn't it? Yeah, it's 20. Yep. He had 18 games last year. That That's where I got tripped up. Uh, either way, 
I think he's good. I think he is going to force the Cubs to play him consistently. And uh, I think he has much more upside than anyone we've talked about so far. Yep. Yeah, I'd agree with that. Maybe in a points league, you'd take like a McCutcheon or a Lamont Wade just because of the plate discipline. But sure. in yeah. category leagues, I, I think just go out and get Morel on your team. I still kind of worry about the playing time long term. But yep. life finds a way, Chris. If this guy keeps hitting the ball as hard as he is and he's running around and stealing bases, they will find a place for Christopher Morel to play. So just get him on your, your leagues and... Get him on your teams in category leagues and, and figure out the rest later. In deeper leagues, a few names that stood out. Casey Schmidt, who we mentioned yesterday, hit a home run in his very first game. He's a prospect with the Giants. He had two more hits on Wednesday and two batted balls over 105 miles per hour. Uh, J.J. Bladé went two for five with his third home run. Only eight games so far with the A's, but batting 379 with those three home runs. Just a 16% strikeout rate. Nick Prado, I keep bringing him up because he just keeps hitting. I, I just don't know if it's real, if there's anything to it. But he went two for four with his second home run. He's betting 362 with a 32% strikeout rate. <laughs> I just don't really get it. Uh, and Michael Massey went three for four with his first home run. He's betting 340 over his last 14 games. We're talking 15 teamers and, and deeper here, Chris. Any interest in these? Casey Schmidt, JJ Blade, Nick Prado, and Michael Massey. I don't think I'm telling any tales out of school when I say that Nick Prado is unlikely to continue hitting 362. He actually does have a 291 XBA, which is weird because his average exit velocity is only 87 miles per hour. Is, I don't really understand. A lot of line drives. Yeah, his line drive rate is 41%. It's a tiny, tiny sample size, but yeah, that'll do it. Uh, that's not sustainable, but... Remember, he had 36 home runs two years ago in the minors, uh, was part of that big Royals, uh, like Northwest Arkansas team uh, with MJ Melendez. I think he's probably second or third on this list, though. I think Casey Schmidt is probably the more the most interesting of the three. I want to give J.J. Blade some credit because his AAA numbers especially are very good. 893 OPS, 27 homers in 110 games with decent plate discipline, but the quality of contact in the majors, even with the three home runs in eight games is pretty middling. So I'm not too enthused there. Um, so yeah, I, I like Casey Schmidt best out of this group. All right, let's hit some news and notes and we'll start with Max Scherzer who attempted to play catch on Wednesday, but cut it short because he was still feeling neck spasms, which yeah, I have a bad feeling here, Chris. It, it's just the writing is on the wall. I think we probably get an IL stint or at least skip another start or something. I, I I would be shocked if this doesn't end in an IL stint yep. at the, after that. Yeah. Yeah. Not looking good for uh, Max Scherzer. Potentially not looking good for Tyler Glass now either, who was removed from his rehab start on Wednesday after just one inning. And uh, apparently he left with general left side tightness. And guess what? He is attempting to return from an oblique injury. So mm -hmm. obviously that's pretty rough news there. Jose Alvarado was placed on the IL with left elbow inflammation. The MRI didn't show anything structurally wrong so glass half full there uh who do you think gets the save opportunities for the phillies moving forward chris there's craig kimbrell and his era which is over seven well that's uh, that's the problem right is you got craig kimbrell Matt you got Schlump. sir anthony dominguez you got uh gregory soto all have closing experience on that team and they've all been dreadful this season i think uh i think soto has the best era out of the three at four five oh uh Strom is Strom is interesting. Uh, he's been really good this season. I think it's 40 strikeouts and in 20 innings or something like that. Two relief appearances that have both been pretty good. I, I think he's a dark horse. I'm not saying add him, but it's something to keep an eye on just because I can't handicap the other three. They, they've all been so bad that I just, I can't really get a sense of it. I, I would guess Kimbrell gets a shot, but there can't be any kind of leash there. Mm-hmm. Uh, I have Strom in a few leagues, and for some reason, it looks like he's projected to start at least on CBS. So I don't know if. But isn't uh, uh, Ranger Suarez is coming? Ranger back. Suarez is coming back. Yeah, that that's yeah. so that I I wouldn't. I don't know. Yeah, I don't think that's going to happen. So I agree with you. I think Matt Strom is a dark horse right now to potentially earn some saves uh, in the meantime for the Phillies. Jose Miranda. This is big, big news, too. I mean, option back to AAA yeah. on Wednesday with Kyle Farmer being reinstated from the IL. 
Chris, are you okay dropping Miranda in redraft leagues? Absolutely. I would drop him for Morrell in a heartbeat. All right. Nico Horner has missed two straight with that mild left hamstring strain. Corey Seager is expected to return early during the Rangers' upcoming homestand, which spans May 15th through the 21st, and he'll begin a rehab assignment at AA on Thursday. Liam Hendricks has at least three re rehab outings left. The schedule calls for back-to-back -back outings over the next few days. I did see that he made an appearance on Wednesday, and uh, he threw a another scoreless outing. So Velocity's been way down. Uh, I think he averaged like 93.5 with his fastball in this one, which is about three and a half miles per hour down. But wow. all things considered, yeah, you know, you, you, it, it might lead to some struggles in his return. We saw that with Carlos Carrasco when he returned midseason uh, after his cancer diagnosis and then going through treatment. It's entirely possible that Liam Hendricks struggles, but I still think he's very much worth stashing. Luis Severino threw 49 pitches in his first rehab start Wednesday. He allowed one run over three and a third innings. Dodgers manager Dave Roberts said that a decision on whether Noah Syndergaard will be placed on the IL won't come before Friday. Syndergaard is dealing with a cut on his right index finger. Drop him. Jesus Sanchez exited early. Yeah, drop him for Yuri Perez. Jesus Sanchez yes. exited early with a right hamstring injury, which is so unfortunate because he's just coming around, right? And he had a mammoth home run in this game. I think it was... 440 feet to straightaway center field. So I hope it's nothing serious, but uh, yeah, Jesus Sanchez has looked really good recently. Yeah. Jan Gomes was activated from the concussion IL and the Cubs option prospect Miguel Amaya back to triple a Gomes went three for three with his sixth home run and is batting 324 this season. If anybody dropped Jan Gomes in a two catcher league, please go pick him up because he's quietly been very, very good for the Cubs this year. Let's take our final break, and when we return, I've got a few pitching performances to talk about right after this. Witness one of the world's biggest stars as a family man. Really? <laughs> May 17th. I just jumped into Stallone. <laughs> There's no place like Stallone. And it's about how hard you can get hit to keep moving forward. He's the last person that wanted to do this show yet. He sees the camera, he's like, am I in frame? That's the truth. The Family Stallone, streaming May 17th, exclusively on Paramount+. Plus. Big thanks to those watching us live on YouTube right now. It's uh, past 1 a.m. Eastern time. we got 575 people watching us. So if you're here, thank you, and please hit that like button. We really appreciate it. Some waiver wire pitchers from Wednesday's action. Seth Lugo turned in another quality start. This one at the Twins. Six innings, two runs, five strikeouts in that one. He's got a... 318 ERA, 129 whip so far in the season. And looks like he's in line for two starts next week up against the Royals and Red Sox. Josiah Gray had another strong start at the Giants. Seven innings, two runs, four walks, so three strikeouts. He's got a 296 ERA, 134 whip. Those things don't really <laughs> line up. So I think there will be some regression on the ERA, but. Right now, it looks like he's in line for two starts against the Tigers and the Marlins next week. So Yeah, add him. He's 59% rostered. is wow. is too low. At, those are just great matchups. Brian Bayo, Chris, we were talking beforehand, turns in his first quality start of the season at the Braves. Really tough matchup, obviously. Six innings, two runs, five strikeouts, 18 swinging strikes on 100 pitches, and he was electric. His velocity was up across the board. His slider up nearly two miles per hour. He was throwing the four-seam fastball up, and he was throwing everything else down in the zone. He was just working it. He looked fantastic. Again, that's Brian Bayo. Uh, and then Dane Dunning, his first two starts filling in for Jacob deGrom have been very solid. And uh, Dean Kramer, back-to-back -back quality starts against the Braves and the Tampa Bay Rays. I don't know, really know where this is coming from, but uh, he pitched very well. Six shutout, four strikeouts, allowed a lot of hard contact, but his velocity was up across the board as well. Chris, how would you rank this group? Josiah Gray, Seth Lugo, Brian Bayo, uh, Dane Dunning, and Dean Kramer. Gray, Bayo, Lugo, Dunning, Kramer. Although Kramer mostly just kind of depends, I think, on where his next start is. If his next start is at home, maybe I'll rank him higher than Dane Dunning. But I think both of those two are clearly in the streaming only conversation. Yeah. Anything else you'd like to add on uh, Brian Bayo and, and what he did in this one against the Braves? I mean, look, we 
one of the things I think Scott said this verbatim in a recent episode, but you know, if you get four straight or if you get four swings and misses on four different pitches, that's that's noteworthy. And that's what Brian Bayo did. His changeup was really good tonight. Four swings and misses on 18 pitches. We know he has upside. He's been pretty bad uh, early in his career, but it was very nice to see a sign of the upside. I, I think there are still going to be there's still going to be some rocky uh, outings in the future. He still had what nine hard hit balls allowed in this one. Um, so I'm not ready to declare that he's just arrived, but there's enough upside here that if if Yuri Perez isn't available, yeah. Brian Bayo is pretty interesting. Yeah, I think I would take both of the Twins guys over him. Yes, over yeah, absolutely. Far, yeah. It's it's not far off from that. Like that's kind of the range yeah. where Bayo and I think could be. Bayo probably has more upside than Ober, at least. I actually do think Varland, you know, in talking and writing about him recently and then talking about him the other day, I, I do think there's a decent amount of upside there. I'm actually pretty excited to see him uh, continue to pitch. Chris, every time I say the name Bayo or I read it, I always think of uh, Bayo Wolf. <laughs> sure. Read the the short story or, I don't know, watch the uh, film back in the day. I think I slept through a class reading of that in high school. <laughs> That sounds about right. I had English class first period. You know, it was tough. Yeah. yeah. Um, every time I read his name, I just want to say like, I am Beowulf. And, and, but I don't know. We'll, we'll save that for, if he becomes a thing, maybe I'll, I'll get the, the sound drop and we'll make it a thing. Edward Cabrera, Chris, you mentioned the name earlier on. And uh, the strikeouts are awesome, but he has just one quality start in eight outings so far this year. He was at the Diamondbacks. I was watching this start. First three innings, cruised, looked amazing. Fourth inning, everything fell apart. Four walks within the inning. He walked the bases loaded and then walked the next day. He walked a run in. Like the, There was just something fundamentally wrong. I, I don't know what it is. I can't explain it. The broadcasters couldn't explain it. He just completely fell apart. That's and, not the first time he's done that, I'm pretty sure. No, uh, it, it's a mess, too. His yeah. velocity was up across the board. I wonder if, like, maybe he was trying to throw too hard, but... This has been an issue all year. It's not like it was just this start. You know, mm -hmm. 7.6 walks per nine. He's still 66% rostered. What do you think about Edward Cabrera? Are we uh, dropping his dropping him? His next start is against the Nationals. So on paper, it's a, a good matchup. It's kind of one of those situations where, like, my preference would be to hang on to him because I still think there's a ton of upside. And But, like, I'm viewing him right now sort of how I would view, like, a top prospect getting called up where I there's upside there's downside he's a huge risk moving forward and I don't have any uh, you can't start him like you just can't 7.6 walks per nine 1.7 whip there's just no way you can start Edward Cabrera right now and so yeah I would rather have Yuri Perez as I said earlier I'd rather have both twins guys I do think there could be a point where Edward Cabrera figures it out figures out the inconsistency and it's just a really really good pitcher but he's not there right now and there there are just too many of these innings where he just doesn't know where the ball is going i think in standard size points leagues you know shallower formats just five man bench there there has to be someone with more upside out there i would drop him for yuri perez as you mentioned the twins guys any of those top three that we just talked about lugo josiah gray i would even do it for brian bayo i, I really liked what i saw from brian bayo in this start too and they're kind of similar in that they, they both had prospect pedigree. Um, yeah. I think Bayo's just trending in the right direction right now. Yeah, I think that's fine. You know, obviously, Cabrera had 20 strikeouts in his previous two starts. So th there's... Strikeouts are not an issue, Chris. Yeah. <laughs> we well, know that. Yeah. Uh, it's, just, um, it's everything else right now, so... Yeah, so I I think that's fine. A, a name... Man, this is an interesting... Sorry, I'm going off topic a little bit, but... Someone in the chat asked if we would drop Graham Ashcraft for Yuri Perez. I would do it. I I think I would, especially now that Graham Ashcraft doesn't have the really pretty ERA, and it's probably going to be harder to trade him. Yeah, I, I think I'd rather have Yuri Perez. Yeah, I, look, don't just drop Graham Ashcraft. Like, Not yet. Onto him. Don't just drop him for anybody. But yeah, for the upside of a Yuri Perez, you know, Scott a couple of weeks ago did come on here and say, hey, look, Try to try and sell high on Graham Ashcraft while you can. And, you know, it, it seems that at least for now he was he was right about that one. 
let's get into some leftovers, Chris. And uh, we had a a pitcher's duel, good old fashioned pitcher's duel between Kevin Gosman and Zach Wheeler. Gosman went six shutout with nine strikeouts. Zach Wheeler, seven innings, one run, seven strikeouts for him. He's uh, throwing this new sweeper 15% this year. One note on Gosman the v- velocity was way up. Fastball velocity up 2.6 miles per hour. The splitter was up 2.4 miles per hour. And I thought I read somewhere that he's been fluctuating his velocity on purpose, Mm -hmm. but I I couldn't find a source. I I feel like maybe I read a tweet somewhere or something, but I couldn't actually find a source to back it up. Uh, Do you know anything about this, like velocity going up and down recently for Kevin Gosman? I haven't seen anything specific. I know Jack Flaherty got kind of mad about being asked why his velocity was down yesterday, and he said something similar, that that's what he was doing. Uh, so it's a thing that pitchers do, certainly. But I I think Kevin Gosman's really, really good. And I'm very, very happy to see that this is happening for him. Obviously, the, the overall ERA is still not quite as pretty as it could be, but I think it will get there. Um, and 338 is not so bad when you're striking out 12 per nine or whatever it is right now. So uh, I I kind of had like, Robbie Ray or Kevin Gosman as my SP two uh, strategy, and oh, I think I drafted more Robbie Ray than Kevin Gosman. Not working out. Yeah, unlikely to work out moving right. forward. You know, it, it, Gosman's such an interesting case too because his BABIP is sky high again this year. It's three fifty, and last yeah. year it was three sixty two. He led all starting pitchers in BABIP last year, and uh, frankly, I, I think he's probably closer to remain in that mid threes ERA range be- because of how much hard contact he gives up. That sure. is not going away. Uh, so there will be some frustrating performances, but of course, you know, you'll get amazing ones like you did here on Wednesday. He, he is a pitcher where X ERA probably tells a better story than FIP and, and X FIP because FIP and X FIP largely assume that player pitchers don't have much control over the quality of contact they allow. We know that's mostly not true, and he does get hit pretty hard when he gets hit. So, yeah, there will be blowups for Kevin Gosman for sure, but I, I think he'll be dominant more often than not. Some pitching standouts, studs being studs. Clayton Kershaw just put together another awesome start. Seven Phenomenal. innings, one run, eight strikeouts to zero walks at the Brewers. Christian Javier put up a season-high 11 strikeouts at the Angels on a season-high 24 swinging strikes. Seems like he's coming around. 17 of those, by the way, came on his four-seam fastball, which... That's pretty impressive. Just awesome stuff. Uh, Justin Verlander was great in his second start. He was at the red, seven innings, one run, seven strikeouts for him. And Pablo Lopez continues his breakout season up against the Padres. Six and a third, one run, eight strikeouts. The walks were high, four walks in this one, but 17 more swinging strikes on 98 pitches. Chris, anything to add on? Pablo Lopez, Verlander... Javier and Clayton Kershaw. Uh, Verlander's velocity was down just a tad, uh, 0.6 miles per hour. Not too concerning given that he's coming back from the injury and he only had, what, the one uh, rehab start. But I I think he's going to be just fine moving forward. Pablo Lopez, he's awesome. He had the, the little tiny hiccup, the two starts where he gave up 10 or 11 earned runs, but He, like you said, I I think the breakout is for real here. And uh, yeah, that's it. I saw someone tweet you. Well, actually, I think they tweeted all of us asking about Clayton Kershaw and you responded. And ranking Kershaw is really tough because we know that more likely than not, he's going to miss time at some point, you know, given the injury history and the age. And And, and the Dodgers of it all. Right. And I have met SP22, but on a per star basis, I think you could expect sp1 numbers from clayton mm-hmm. kershaw we just can't rank him that way because of his injury history it's it's a lot like Degrom, where you know if i knew he was gonna make every start he's the sp1 right like that's where i'm ranking him mm-hmm. but coming into the year i ranked him at sp12 because it was with the assumption he's going to miss time so i think clayton kershaw is similar yeah clayton kershaw has made 30 starts since the start of the 2022 season he's got a 234 era actually it's probably lower than that after tonight's start 185 strikeouts and 169 innings before tonight. Like you said, I think he's an SP one when he's healthy. It's just, I am more, I'm not particularly confident that any specific player is ever going to go on the IL. I am pretty confident Clayton Kershaw is going to go on the IL at some point. That's just, 
he doesn't make 30 starts anymore. He hasn't made 30 starts since 2019. Actually, he hasn't made 30 starts since 2015. He hasn't made 29 starts since 2019. So it's like where I would rank him today and where I would rank him for the rest of the season are very different. Um, But yeah, he's top 25 rest of season, top 10 right now. A few hitting leftovers. Anthony Volpe went one for four with his first career grand slam, his fourth home run of the season. Miguel Vargas went one for five with his fourth home run. The batting average isn't there in the month of May, but as I mentioned yesterday, lots of extra base hits so far in the month. Three doubles, one triple, and three home runs for Miguel Vargas. Marcus Semien went two for five with his sixth home run and is off to a great start. Last year, it was the opposite. The first you know, two months of the year, he, he, he was... One of the worst hitters in baseball. So far, he's batting 290 with six homers, 30 runs, 30 RBI, and five steals. Yeah, it might just be like we do all these like, oh, we're investigating the baseball. We're pulling it apart thread by thread. And we're looking. Maybe it's just like, is Marcus Simeon hitting well in April? If he's not, it's a dead ball. If he is, it's a live ball. Maybe that's it. Maybe Marcus Simeon's just the juiced ball uh, canary in the coal mine for us. I can't say enough about what the Rangers have done so far. The fact that they are playing this well and their offense has been this great without Corey Seager and Mm -hmm. without Jacob deGrom recently, uh, just overall for their pitching staff, it's, man, it's such a testament. And and great job by by Bruce Bochy, right? Like, he's he's done a really good job. Hey, love to see a team going for it and being rewarded. You know, that's also a good thing. Hunter Renfro has quietly had a very solid season himself. He went two for two with his 10th home run of the year. Wander Franco continues his breakout when one for three with a walk an RBI and added two more steals. He's now up to 11 steals on the season. Pete Alonzo has been struggling recently, but went one for three with his league leading 13th home run slap hitter, Ronald Acuna. That's right. That guy, he went two for four with a 470 foot home run. His seventh of the season. He is batting 347 with seven homers, 15 steals. He is the number one player in Roto so far, but He's a slap hitter, so keep that in mind. Patrick Wisdom went one for four with a walk and his 12th home run. And Vinny P. Do I still have it? Baby. Yeah. Vinny Pasquantino went three for five with a double and two runs scored. He now has three straight multi-hit games and is approaching a 300 batting average. Some bullpen updates for the Rockies. Pierce Johnson allowed a hit and walk, but struck out two for his sixth save of the season. Daniel Bard continues to work in lower leverage. Uh, Pierce Johnson, 25% rostered if you do need saves. For the Rangers, Will Smith struck out two for his sixth save. For the Marlins, A.J. Puck struck out two for his sixth save. For the Blue Jays. How does A.J. Puck only have six saves? Like, because I, I think he has three wins or something, something crazy. Because like nobody else on the Marlins has multiple saves, right? They ha- Tanner guess- Scott has two. I'm guessing they had, yeah, because they had a, they had a bunch of like one run. Well, they're twelve and zero and run one run games. Yeah, so I think some of those games, AJ. Yeah, Park, they must have some walk offs. Yeah, he's unavailable. So, um, yeah, that's why they got Tanner Scott involved. For the Blue Jays, Jordan Romano uh, got the ninth with a one run lead. He gave up three hits, a run, and took the blown save. And he's been a little shaky recently. He's got a three six zero ERA and a one two seven WHIP, but. I looked into the numbers and, and there's something there. He like, yeah. yeah, actually he's pitching better than frankly he ever has. So yeah. at least the underlying numbers say that for Jordan Romano for the Astros, Ryan Presley entered the ninth with a three run lead. He gave up two runs and did escape with his sixth save of the season for the Orioles. Felix Bautista was unavailable because he threw 29 pitches on Tuesday. Uh, Yanir Cano got the ninth with a one run lead. You'll never guess. He didn't allow a base runner. He didn't allow a run. <laughs> Continues to have a zero ERA on the season. His third save, 35% rostered. Chris, I just think that this guy needs to be rostered in all category leagues at this point. Yanir Cano. Uh, yeah, yeah. I think that's that's reasonable. 35% rostered, probably a little bit low, but you can't really use him in points leagues right now. And he he needs a Felix Bautista injury that is the, the long and short of it. So don't you? Yeah. Don't even speak. Well, no, I, yeah, I, I, that's the thing is I don't want Yenny or Cano uh, to, to have value in those points leagues. So it's like, you know, saves plus holds, must roster. You know, he's in that, uh, you know, high, high end, non-closer 
situation and he'll get a couple of saves. Yeah. Felix Bautista is probably my most rostered relief <laughs> pitcher this season. So it, it makes me a little bit nervous that frankly, there is a reliever pitching even better than him in the same bullpen for the Mets, a one run game. Adam Adovino got the eighth and David Robertson got the ninth for his seventh save for the Red Sox. Kenley Jansen allowed a hit, but picked up his ninth save and the 400th save of his career. Chris is Kenley Jansen, a hall of famer. Cause I, I kind of feel like no one talks about it, but if we bring it up about Craig Kimbrell, then I feel like we should also bring it up for Kenley Jansen. You know, despite the the sort of loud protestations from the fantasy community over the last like six years, he's aging better than Craig Kimbrell. I mean, there, there's been like yeah. a concerted movement among the fantasy community to like get Kenley Jansen out of the closer role basically every year since like 2018, but he's remained pretty good. You know, it's, I don't know if he's a Hall of Famer, 400 saves. It's quite a bit. I believe it's the active leader. Um, I'll say fringe guy for now. We'll see how the, the next couple of seasons go. Okay. Uh, and Heck of a career, though. Converted <laughs> catcher getting to 400 saves. He was He was playing for the Netherlands in like the 2008 World Baseball Classic as a catcher, I'm pretty sure. Yeah, that, that sounds about right. It's uh, It's been an awesome career for Kenley Jansen. Uh, I was kind of stalling here because I wanted to write. I forgot to write it to stream or not to stream. So I was trying well, to. I, and I just abruptly started to stop talking. I'm sorry. <laughs> it's totally fine. You had no idea that I was unprepared. Um, it's just, it's on me. All right. Well, anywho, let's get into it. Uh, to stream or not to stream, we'll start with Thursday. I think uh, Bailey Ober against the Padres is the obvious one. And uh, a big old maybe for Domingo Herman versus Tampa Bay. Yeah, I mean, Baylor over, I don't want to get ahead of ourselves. I would not be surprised if he struggled. San Diego's a very good team, but yeah, he's the clear. He barely counts for this. I think he's not just a streamer. He should be added for longer term as well. Correct. And then on Friday, uh, okay, here's... Let's throw Yuri Perez out there. Yes. See the Reds. I think so. It's at home. Yeah. Let's do it. Absolutely. Let's do that. Logan Allen, if he's still available in your league, he should not be up against the Angels. Tougher matchup, but um, I'm all right using Logan Allen. Mm, who else do we have here? Drew Smiley. Same conversation. Uh, you know, I'm pretty I think the Twins have been bad against lefties. So uh, and Drew Smiley has pitched really well. So I'm good with that one. I know the last three starts have really soured us on him uh, and rightly so. But Johan Oviedo at Baltimore. I don't hate that one. And Kyle Bradish versus Pittsburgh. I don't hate. Yeah, going up against each other there. Wow, lots lots of names. Tyler McGill at the Nationals, not bad yeah. either. So and Logan Allen against the Angels. If you mentioned that one, I think you did. Yeah. Again, I, that's one that I think is less of a streamer and more just someone I want on my roster. All right. So use the prospects, Yuri Perez and Logan Allen, and then if I'm just putting a bow on this, I'll say. Bradish up against the Pirates, Tyler McGill at the Nationals, and uh, Drew Smiley at the Twins. We're going to wrap there for Chris. I am Frank. Thanks, as always, for tuning in to Fantasy Baseball today. Please make sure to follow and leave a five-star rating on Apple or Spotify. We'll be back again tomorrow. Bye-bye. <laughs>